uh, the first scripture reading today is from Deuteronomy 23, 12 through 14. Designate a place outside the camp where you can go to relieve yourself. As part of your equipment, have something to dig with. And when you relieve yourself, dig a hole to cover up your excrement. For the Lord your God moves about in your camp to protect you and to deliver and to deliver your enemies to you. Your camp must be holy so that he will not see among you anything indecent and turn away from you. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians 14, 33 through 35. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations <clears throat> excuse me, of the Lord's people. Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. <clears throat> if they want to inquire about something, they should ask their husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. The word of God for the people of God. God. Wasn't that just precious? <laughs> you know, in 40 years of ministry and thousands and thousands of sermons, I have to admit, I've never used that Deuteronomy text before. This is a first, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I, briefly this week, I thought, you know what would be really fun? If, if I could hand everybody a small digging tool as they came in this morning. <laughs> and they would say, well, what's this for? And I'd say, you know what, just hang on to that for a while. You'll, you'll, get, you'll get that later. I, I do wish, though, that... Um, a few years ago when I was in Liberia, I wish the, some of the Liberians who had uh, lived in Monrovia at the time had actually read that text because the United Methodist compound was about a half a block from the ocean and there was a large beach there. And uh, many of them who went to the beach had forgot their trial. Um, and so that was just a, a part of the culture that went on there. And what's really interesting when you talk about this scripture and the theology of God said it, I believe it, and that settles it for me. Um, in the 1880s, when indoor plumbing was kind of becoming popular and churches were being built with it and they were adapting churches for it, um, this was the debate. People pulled this scripture out and said, oh no, people can't use the restroom inside the building. It really doesn't matter where it goes afterwards. That, you know, God said in Deuteronomy, you know, you set a place outside to do that. It reminds me of that old hillbilly joke, talking to people from the big city, and he says, so I understand you guys go to the bathroom inside, but you prefer to cook outside. He says, I understand that completely. If we went to the bathroom inside the house, we'd prefer to cook outside too. And so that's enough potty humor. Okay, we're done with that. But the point is that we have to wrestle with the term, God said it. And what does that mean? How do we, how do we interpret that? How do we understand that? How do we begin to practice in our lives? Because I think we wouldn't be here this morning if we didn't value some understanding of the revelation of God and the truth that is embodied in that. And so there's a piece of this statement that's really understandable. Yeah, if God said something, I need to believe that and I need to practice that and that's obviously really important, but how do I know what God says? And how do I interpret that and work that out? It pushes us to try to understand that in terms of the scripture. And, you know, last week a little bit I touched on this whole idea of the Bible as very complex and very difficult and we all interpret. And the reality is this, that all of us, as we read the Bible or as you hear messages on the Bible or you interact with the scriptures, we value certain pieces of it more than we value others. 
certain scriptures, certain stories are more important to us than other scriptures and other stories. Vividly illustrated this morning in the reading from 1 Corinthians, as we have a lady here who is speaking to the congregation of the church, reading the scripture, when the scripture clearly says, you can't do that. Nobody got up and left. Nobody was probably upset by that. We were all just kind of a little amused by that. But it's in the Bible. It's the scriptures. It's what Paul wrote to the Christians at Corinth. And so, how do we work with this? How do we deal with this? If we're not going to interpret all of it on a level playing field as every scripture in the Bible is the word of God and we are to live that literally, then how do we sort through it? And how do we live with that in the midst of that? You know, I mean, there are a lot of ways to interpret that, a lot of ways to look at that. I think some people would say, well, you know what? There are a few things that you just don't mess with, like the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, now, those are old and they're traditional, and we ought to live by those Ten Commandments. I guess I'd have to say people who say that have never read them. First commandment, you shall not make for yourself any image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water below. Any of you have art in your house? Any of you have a sculpture of something or a painting of something? Any of you have antlers hanging on the wall or a deer head someplace? Any of you have anything? Any of you have a nativity? If you do, you're not living by this. You've already thrown out the first commandment because we have those things in our homes, in our possessions. Any of you who are artists may do those things. You may make those things. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Oh, my Lord. There it is. How many of us have that as a common expression? And yet the commandment clearly says we shouldn't do that. And it doesn't say just in terms of profanity. It says that we should, the terms that we use for God, like God and Lord, those should be sacred in our speech. But we don't, nobody, I don't know anybody that lives that way. We use those terms interchangeably in a variety of different ways. We don't mean disrespect by that most of the time, but that's what we do and that's how we live. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant or your female servant or your animals or any foreigner residing in your towns. How many of us tinker around on the Sabbath? How many work on the Sabbath? How many have a vocation that, that asks you or demands that you work on the Sabbath? So obviously, the Ten Commandments, while important, we don't take those literally. We don't apply those to our lives as a strict rule as they are expressed in Exodus 20. You may pull back and say, you know what, well, yeah, that's Old Testament. And so the Old Testament is kind of on a different standard than New Testament. But now when it comes to Jesus and the teachings and the words of Jesus, now those are sacred, those are really important. And I think most people would agree with that. But most of us probably know what Jesus says about divorce. And we don't practice that. We don't practice that in the church. I, I don't know of hardly any church anywhere that practices that. I have many colleagues who fill a pulpit every Sunday morning who have been divorced and remarried. We don't, we don't hold that standard in the church. But Jesus says that. The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, Jesus says that. Jesus also says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Now, I don't know about you, but I have retirement funds. Most people probably have retirement funds. We have a variety of different investments. We have a variety of different ways that we keep and store our wealth. Jesus clearly says, don't do that. Don't store that stuff up. But we don't live like that. Matter of fact, we would think not to live 
with some kind of savings or some kind of stuff. We have people who teach on finances and how to be a wise financial steward, and, and they'll tell you to save. They'll tell you to, to put that money back and to store that stuff up. Now, is Jesus implying something else here? Maybe, but that's what it says. He also goes on to say, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you shall eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Do you worry? Do you worry about things? About things about your life? How many of us do? We almost all do. And so when we look at this and we're talking about what does God say, we can see pretty quickly it gets hard because the standards around that become really flexible of, uh, for us. And the truth is, when you read the scriptures, one of the things you understand is that Jesus didn't live by that theology. I, I see some of you went, huh? Really? Case in point, on divorce. The Old Testament law on divorce was that a man could give a woman a certificate of divorce and then she would be divorced. What did Jesus do? Jesus went back to that and said, yeah, that's what the Bible says, but let me tell you what God really meant by that. And he ups the standard to hear. He didn't, he didn't take what the law was literally and say, this is what God said. He took what the law was literally and said, this is, this is what the law says, but let me help you understand what God really meant by that, what the meaning is behind that. He did the same thing with the Sabbath. The commandment, you shouldn't work on the Sabbath. Not your kids, not your servants, nobody that you are responsible for should be employed and working on the Sabbath. That was a big deal in Jesus' time, and that was really strict. But what did Jesus do when he came? Jesus said, oh, God didn't mean that. God didn't mean it like that. God meant for you to respect the Sabbath and honor the Sabbath, but... The way you people honor and respect it isn't what God intended by that. And so he took the standards of the day and loosened them and made them less and said, yeah, there are certain things you can do on the Sabbath, and that's not a bad thing. That's not wrong. And it was considered wrong at the time. I want to be really clear when I say this morning that the point is we should not try to listen to God. That's, that's not the point. The point is, is not that it doesn't matter what God says. And I want you to know that because I think what God says is really, really important. The point is, again, how do you and I interpret that? How do we know that? How do we live that? Adam, in his chapter on this, writes about the fact that, you know, for him... He uses the life and the teachings of Jesus as kind of the, the foundation for understanding and interpreting all Scripture. And he reflects that into the life and teaching of Jesus as kind of the standard. And I thought about what, Am what Adam was writing about, Adam Hamilton, and I thought, how do I do that? How do I live that out in my own life, in my own theology? How do I look at various texts or scriptures or things that are going on in the world and try to decide, is this the activity of God or is this not the activity of God? How do I look at that? And you know what I realized was that, for me, I have a few what I consider to be basic or anchor scriptures that are just fundamental and foundational in my life. One of them is from Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus was asked one day, What's the greatest commandment? And most of us probably know the response to that. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus went on to say, every law, every commandment is based on these two. That's anchor for me. When I look at something or when something comes to me and I'm trying to interpret, is this God's will? Is this God's presence? Is this God speaking? If it violates either, any, either one of those, then I put it in question. 
Because Jesus boiled it down to that central word and said, it's all built on this. There are other scriptures that are that way for me. In the Old Testament, Micah 6, 8, Micah writes this, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? But to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. See, there are scriptures like that for me that just take our religious experience, our belief in God, the relationship we had with God, and they boil it down to the very simplest of terms. To love justice, mercy, and to walk humbly with God. And see, there is a key. Because I do believe that when we read the Scripture, God speaks to us through that. I do believe that as we live our lives and practice spiritual disciplines like prayer and worship and fasting and other things that we do, God speaks to us through that. But Micah gets it right when Micah says, but you are to be humble in the presence of God. And when we get it wrong, I think, is when we have our beliefs, I have my convictions, I think this is what's right, and then I go to the scriptures and I search through the Bible to try to make sure I can find some scripture someplace that justifies what I want to say. So if I really believe that women should have no role in the life of the church that is a leadership role, then I can run to 1 Corinthians and I can pull that out and I can say, well, this is what Paul wrote and this is what's in the Bible. And forget the rest of it. And when we do that, then we are no longer humble before God. We are basically taking the scriptures and saying, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to shore up what I believe. I'm just trying to make sure that I can use the Bible to prove what I feel is right or what I believe should be the way things are. You know, I don't believe there are absolutes about this in the fact that I can give you a proof this morning that you can take to all situations and all circumstances and prove this is the will of God for me, this is not the will of God for me, this is the voice of God for me, this is not. But I think there are practices that we can use that do guarantee that. I think the scriptures are pretty clear about the fact that as God lives in relationship with us and values us as a part of God's creation, and as God expresses to us over and over again that we are precious to God, what God also says is, I want to guide you. I want to share with you God's wisdom, God's grace, God's truth, and God wants to speak into our worlds and into our lives that way. And I think the key is what Micah says. When we approach Scripture, or when we, when we approach any spiritual discipline with the attitude of, God, I, I just want you to, to speak into my heart whatever you want me to hear, whatever you want me to understand, whatever you want me to know today, I want you to know that I, I'm not coming here trying to prove something. I'm coming here trying to learn something. I'm coming here humble, believing that you know what's best, not me. And that I want to honor what you want in my life, not what I want in my life. I think when we approach God that way, we honor God, we honor the relationship with God, and then when we hear God speak, then we can say, yeah, God spoke, and I believe that. And that's important to me. It's not the easiest thing in the world. And I think that's what this half-truth is trying to express to us. Just because you find something written someplace in the Bible 
doesn't mean that you can take that and apply that literally in all situations and all circumstances. That the Bible is a living word and it is to be interpreted and understand, understood in every generation and in every people. And we are to listen to God speak into your heart and my heart using that word and other disciplines that are a part of our world and our life. And only when we really know by the humbling of our spirit, the word of God, can we live with the conviction that this is the word of God that has been spoken to my world and my life. And I believe that. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, Lord, I thank you for giving us your word and for giving us the wisdom to read it and to try to apply it to our world and to our lives. Help us, Lord, every time we approach it, every time we approach you, to approach you with the spirit of humility that you are God and we are not. And that you want to teach us and you want to lead us and you want to show us and you want to speak into our world and into our lives and enrich us by that word. Help us, Lord, to live in relationship with you in such a way that your word lives within us. In your name we pray. Amen.